Hello everyone, Helen here. I'm going to chat to you from my craft room this week and uh, welcome along to everybody, whether you've been here lots of times or if you're quite new. And it's been lovely to hear from lots of you who've been catching up on oh, lots and lots of my older podcasts. There's plenty to catch up on if you haven't uh, seen or been here since the beginning. So that's lovely and I've, I've had such lovely comments. And it's actually been quite nice because um, I've been reminded of, you know, of quite a lot of things that I've done in the past just by people making little comments on, on them. So thank you for that. And just thank you to everybody for continuing to watch and tell me that you enjoy all the things that I really love to share here on my little little friendly quiet corner of YouTube. So today uh, I've got uh, mostly I'm talking about the wolf uh, that I've just recently made and a new project and um, yeah lots of things to do with the wolf and then we're going to do some baking at the end we're going to go off into the kitchen so I hope you're going to enjoy sitting back and uh, listening to all of that this week. <laughs> so, so the wolf. Well, the last time I showed you the wolf on my podcast, he was only a head. So that's as far as I'd got. Uh, but because I've been interspersing camper van videos, it's sort of longer between each time I chat to you about crafting. So, uh, so he is now finished. And those of you who do follow me on Instagram, uh, which uh, where I'm at Mousy Makes Pod, and uh, then you'll have seen that the wolf is finished, and it's been oh, it's been a really really enjoyable process, and kind of um, including including other people who have followed me on Instagram because. Oh, I'll tell you about that shortly, actually. Uh, but yeah, anyway, so, so here is the finished wolf. And he, I, I went through the usual process of when I'd finished him, giving him a bath and then lying him flat uh, and leaving him to dry. And I, I don't uh, give, I haven't given every animal that I've made uh, a bath because sometimes the yarn just seems fine without it. But particularly when it's a bit more of a rustic yarn like this one, and I bought the yarn as a kit from Daughter of a Shepherd, uh, then then it just feels, it, uh, it feels better afterwards. The animal feels better for having had a, a bit of a, a, a bath. So, although I don't usually dip the head in, I have to say, and I don't mind that the head is a little bit rougher and yeah, that, that's okay. Uh, the yarn is Ram Jam yarn, which is produced by Daughter of a Shepherd. And I have talked about it before. I might have even last time when I showed you his head. And they, but in case you didn't see that, uh, they they collect, Daughter of a Shepherd collects um, a fleeces that other wool producers don't, uh, don't use. And they make it into yarn and it's perfect for making animals with. Uh, now, interestingly, the uh, wolf is quite a bit taller than it says in the book. Oh, I haven't said which book I'm doing it from, just in case you're watching for the first time. Uh, the book the, that I have been using for all the animals, sorry to everybody who's heard this a zillion times before, is Moosh and Friends by Cynthia Valle, and all of the toys in her book are knitted seamlessly. So you start at the nose, create the head, and then you work downwards there. So yes, yeah. So in the book it says that the wolf should end up at about as about uh, twenty seven centimeters, which is about ten and a half inches. And my wolf is actually quite a bit taller than that, and um, he is uh, thirty four centimeters. Or that's about 13 inches so it's quite a, quite a difference and I don't normally have a gauge that is way out from you know the patterns that I use sometimes it is a bit off but not by that much 
And I just find it interesting that the, exactly the same thing happened when I made the donkey, which was also using Ram Jam yarn in a kit from Daughter of a Shepherd, uh, that the donkey was way taller than it said in the book. So I, I don't really know why that is, especially as Cynthia Valle um, lists Daughter of a Shepherd yarn as the one that she used. So that's a mystery to me. I really don't know why. And you might remember that when I made the donkey and I made his dungarees, I just ran out of yarn for doing the, the full item of clothing and I had to go and get some more from them. They kindly gave me some for free, a little bit. And yeah, and the same thing actually has happened with the uh, donkey, with the donkey, no, with the wolf, sorry, uh, which is that I had enough yarn to, to knit the wolf and... Uh, but I felt like when I was knitting the jumper, I was running out of yarn a bit for that, which is why I put an extra bit of patterning in. And the trousers are supposed to be knitted from the same grey as the wolf. And there definitely wasn't going to be enough of that, especially when I used a bit in the jumper. <laughs> um, so I just decided that, uh, well, Wolfie said that he would be quite fancy some green trousers and he likes to blend in with the woods when he's out and about. So yes, um, uh, I, I then made his jumper and trousers, which was very straightforward to do. It's a top-down jumper. And the colour work is done by slipping stitches rather than um, bringing your yarn all the way around by, uh, at the back of your knitting. So that was, that was really nice and easy to do. And as, I, as I've just said, I added this extra little pattern at the bottom, which it looks quite nice, actually. Quite pleased with that. Uh, very pleased with how his trousers turned out. And yeah, I think he's really lovely. And I did on Instagram um, ask for ideas for his name because I wasn't quite sure what to call him. In the book, he's called Tino the Wolf. And he just didn't look like a Tino to me because they're all quite slightly different. When you make your own, it looks very slightly different to other people's. And so so I did quite like the idea of Wilf Wolf because it just sounded funny when you said it, Wilf Wolf. And so I asked on Instagram for any ideas. And there were so many really great ideas for names. And I just felt sorry I couldn't use them all. <laughs> but one or two people had suggested Wilfred. And so I was going to go with that. And, and well, in fact, I have decided that when he was born, his mother called him Wilfred and and she would call him Wilf. But in fact, somebody else suggested Wolfie and spelt W-O-O-L-F-I-E. Uh, and I just really like that. I like that play on words. And so I decided that all of his friends call him Wolfie. So even though he was he was born Wilfred, uh, he's all of his friends call him Wolfie. So that was really nice. Uh, so then I just had his bag to knit. So I started knitting that and soon realised that I was going to run out of yarn if I put the pocket on the front. So I decided to leave off the pocket and I did just have enough to um, to knit the bag and the flap and, and the strap that goes over his body. So I was glad that I had left out the, the pocket of the button. So, um, although maybe I could have done it in a different colour or something, but anyway, I didn't. And then I had to look for some suitable buttons. Uh, so, and again, I ended up posting some pictures on Instagram. I took three photos because what I did was uh, I looked through my button boxes. I've got several, they've all sorted out actually. So uh, I looked in the one that had kind of rustic brownish buttons that I thought would look good. Um, and I found, I found a pair of brass buttons first and I thought, mm, yeah, they look quite nice. Uh, then I found 
a smallish leather covered bun and I really like that and so I searched and searched and searched through my buttons uh, to try and find a matching one but of course I couldn't I found close matches but not the identical button to make a pair and then I found uh, a, a bigger leather covered button and eventually found one that was almost the same uh, they obviously had come off some clo old clothing and <laughs> they were a little bit worn out but, no, but really nice I thought they, they would look nice as well so I took photos of the bag with just with the buttons laid on I didn't sew them on with the brass buttons the mismatched pair and then the more matching but bigger buttons and asked people what they thought and oh, I, I was I was delighted that so many people expressed their opinion and the brass buttons were the least popular, um, although I do think they look nice and quite a few people said, said they did, well, did look nice, um, but they preferred the other ones. And I loved somebody's suggestion, oh, I can't remember who it was. Can't remember, but they said that the brass buttons would look really nice on a, a waistcoat or vest for Wolfie. And so I really, really fancy doing that because I think they would look really nice. Uh, and uh, yeah so and so many opinions on uh, on the buttons and I just wrote some down in my notebook here that I just didn't want to forget so Esther was giving me the kind of the ideas for the idea be behind using the each of the sets of buttons so she said maybe the the two matching brown matching-ish brown leather buttons would be good because they've been roughed up by Wolfie's forest travels I said maybe the mismatched pair she said because they're whimsical perhaps he had a matched pair and then lost one and found another one that wasn't a perfect match but did the job and she thought that if I chose the brass buttons that they look quite fancy and perhaps Wolfie found them on the forest floor and maybe a posh couple had had a picnic and the two buttons had fallen off the lady's sweater so I loved that I loved all those little little uh, ideas there and uh, I loved it Jane said that the big the bigger leather buttons reminded her of her dad's iron jumper so I thought that was rather nice and Julie had an excellent suggestion which she said is it possible to have just one button in the center and I thought, wow, that, that was really good. And so I kind of tried it and I thought, yeah, that looks really good. But then I had another um, comment on Instagram, uh, which sort of changed my mind away from the very sensible one button option. <laughs> and, uh, and this was a comment by Mary, who has a lovely YouTube channel. If you haven't been there, I suggest you go and go and visit her. She's at Slow Crochet. I'll, I'll leave a link below as well. Anyway, Mary commented. In fact, her comment was just a little story. I'm just going to read it out to you. Wolfie had the perfect leather buttons on his satchel. But alas, while gathering blackberries one late summer afternoon, he snagged one and lost it in the thicket. Forlorn, his friends each searched their button collections for the most apt replacement and made a present of the possibilities. Wolfie's friends never revealed who was ultimately chosen, whose was ultimately chosen, sorry. So when Wolfie looks at his satchel, he credits all his kind friends. Well, I, I just thought that was absolutely lovely and it set a little spark going in my head and I then spent three days completely obsessed with turning that little story or the elements of it into a story poem. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't do much else. Uh, I forgot about housework, everything. While I was just busy getting this story down onto paper and refining it, tweaking it. And so it is finished now and I thought I would read it out to you even though I really I wanted to read it to you when I'd taken lots of photos of uh, well to illustrate the story or maybe do some drawings so I do have plans to do that um, and if I ever turn this story into a book then it will definitely be dedicated to to Mary who gave me the idea because it was a great idea and 
quite happy. Mary, I hope you're really happy with <laughs> with the resulting story poem. Uh, so why don't you just sit down quietly, just pretend you're a child again or something and listen to me reading my story. Wolfie and the Button by Helen Ketteridge Out in the woods on a late summer day, Wolfie went strolling along, his heart full of gladness at all that he saw, a place where a wolf could belong. Over his body, a neat woollen bag, and holding it safely together, the flap of the satchel was held by two buttons, scruffy and made from brown leather. Ochre in hue, Wolfie loved his dear satchel, with buttons so terribly smart. He proudly marched onward, enjoying the sunshine, a hop and a skip in his heart. Collecting some berries was Wolfie's intention, to make some sweet blackberry juice. And before very long he was there in the brambles, gathering what nature produced. But while he was busy, unnoticed by Wolfie, one button got caught on a twig. It came off completely, fell silently downward into the undergrowth thick. The berries were gathered and Wolfie set off, unaware of the thing he had lost, while down on the ground a small leather button lay under the hairy green moss. As Wolfie walked homeward with basket of berries, his hand reaching casually down to familiar buttons, Oh, what had happened? His face fell right into a frown. He looked at his satchel. A button was missing. Oh, where had the little thing gone? Wolfie felt wretched. Where could it have got to? He sighed, feeling really forlorn. He rushed to the bramble patch, desperately seeking the thing that had dropped to the ground. No sign could he spot in the rambling thicket. No leathery item was found. With a sorrowful sigh, Wolfie got on his way, wondering whether he'd find a solution to the lack of a button upon his best bag. Would he find a well-matched substitution? A chattering sound could be heard in the distance, and very soon Wolfie detected a gaggle of friends who spotted the wolf, whose appearance was deeply dejected. The friends gathered round him and listened to Wolfie, the donkey, two pigs and a bear, and Henri Clement and Catkin the cat, all of his friends were right there. My favourite satchel is missing a button, disappeared while I gathered some fruit. And I've looked and I've looked, but no sign can I see. I've inspected the whole of my route. Just leave it to us, said the friends with compassion. Go home for a nice cup of tea. You'll go off on a quest for your old leather button. Just sit there and wait patiently. So Wolfie went home while the friends went off searching, each hoping that they would retrieve a suitable button for Wolfie's fine satchel. And promptly they all took their leave. And strange as it seems, there were buttons aplenty waiting around to be found. Some in the woods and some by the path dotted around on the ground. Catkin found one on a toadstool, while Dapper found his in a tree. On a carved wooden bench by the oak trees, another was found by Henri. Matthew and Rose found a couple, lodged in a small mossy mound, and another was set on a fence post by Joanna the bear it was found. When the friends met once more, they put all of the buttons into a small woollen bag and they trotted along feeling ever so proud as they made their way home down the track. Let's give them to Wolfie, and he can decide if the buttons we've found him will do. But we'll leave him in peace as he looks through the bag. He needs time to think it all through. Later that day, Wolfie found on his doorstep a bag with a button collection, and with feelings of joy at the kindness of friends, he gradually made his selection. So although his new button was not like the first one, he really did not mind a jot, 
for his friends had displayed such a shining example of kindness, it meant such a lot. Wolfie got busy with blackberries sweet and made juice that just tasted sublime. And he gave each kind friend an exceptional thank you for caring and giving their time. So Dapper and Henri and Matthew and Rose, plus Joanna and Catkin the cat, found on their doorstep some blackberry juice with a label displaying a heart. He had gained no impression of who found the button he'd sewn to his satchel that day. Did it matter? Of course not. Each friend was warm-hearted in every conceivable way. So I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> um, okay then, so I've, I've just got one new project to share with you today and that is another animal. Yes, I am completely obsessed with making these animals. And now I'm really surprised at myself that I am doing this animal because every time I'm nearly finished one of the animals and I'm thinking about which one I want to make next, I keep thinking, first of all, I think, oh, I think I'll make the duck, the mother duck next. And um, and then and then I think, oh, no, maybe I'll make the sheep, Aggie, Aggie the sheep. And so far, I haven't made either of those. And I think it's because, well, the duck, I have to make the effort to learn a different kind of cast on. I think it might be called a Turkish cast on. Anyway, I've got to have so, so so that you can you start at the end of the beak and it's so that you can have a a long flat edge to the beak. And so yeah, I'm just maybe I'm just being a little bit lazy there and thinking, oh I've got to learn that new technique. <laughs> so I will get around to doing that one though. And then Aggie the sheep. Well, I, I don't have a problem with making the sheep because she doesn't look too much different to the other ones that I've made. But I do know um, that the the shaggy coat that the sheep has to wear, and which you just have to make, otherwise she just won't look right, um, is quite a, a well again, it's a new it's a it's one of that that kind of loopy pattern. And I've never done that before and so I'm just yeah. I'm building up. I'm building up to being brave enough to do that one there. So, so, so the animal that actually jumped onto my needles was Hazel the squirrel, and um, you can see here that I have just got as far as her arms, and I've actually stuffed the arms already because I've got all the way down to the point of doing her legs. So she's much smaller than. Um, than the wolf and the donkey. It's a much, much smaller one, much daintier, more the size of the, the piggies, the two piggies that I've made. And uh, yeah, and I'm using Knit Picks palette for ply and it it doesn't really, really need to be blocked. I, I haven't blocked every single one of the animals that I've made, or bathed them, should I say. And so, yeah, so the thing with uh, Hazel the Squirrel is, what was just that I really, really struggled with the ears because for the first time, instead of you marking the stitches where the where you'll pick up later for the ears, you marking them with yarn so it makes it easy to pick up the stitches. This time there was just a whole load of pearl bumps that you had to look out for, and oh, I just found that really, really hard. But it, I think the ears are in the right place. I don't know by some miracle, I've managed to do that. And they were, I did find them quite quite tough to knit, especially to get going. And I even had a, a casualty of one of my uh, double pointed needles just, just snapped. Um, yeah, I don't quite know how I managed that, but that was when I was doing the ears. Um, so apart from the Knit Picks palette four ply that I'm using, the pattern did say if you wanted to, you could incorporate some mohair for the top half of the ears and I think also for the tail so yes I haven't, haven't done the tail yet so I will do that because it's nice and fluffy so 
yeah so this is uh, so in the book she's called hazel the squirrel and I th she does look like a hazel to me so for once i'm actually going to use the name from the book and yeah so i think i inter interrupted myself there um <laughs> i've decided to stuff the arms because i'm not giving her a bath and they are quite thin at, at the hand end or the paw end and I just thought that if I left the stuffing until I put the legs on and then you just have a tiny little hole to put all the stuffing into, it would be uh, more difficult than usual. So I've done that bit and I've kind of stuffed the top half of her body. And yeah, so I'm ready, ready to do the legs now. And yeah, so there we go. That is Hazel the Squirrel. And I've got one or two other projects on the go that are not animals, but I think I'll leave them for another time. Tell you about them. Tell you about them maybe the next time I'm sitting here. And uh, I'm going to take you into the kitchen now. So I, I started a little series in my podcast ages ago, and I was going to do them quite regularly, but I haven't. I've done twice before uh, where I've chosen a recipe that I've never ever done before. So I think I made a Swiss roll as part of this little series which I'd never made before and that did turn out okay I was quite pleased with how that turned out and I made some rough puff pastry and then used it for something because I'd never made rough puff pastry before and I thought it's about time I had a go at something else so I decided to make some chocolate eclairs uh, which I've never made before and that involves making shoe pastry so I actually, uh, I didn't use just one recipe uh, for the whole of the chocolate eclairs. I used a book by Richard Bertonet called Pastry. <laughs> so he just, it takes you through with lots of photos and things, how to make all the different kinds of pastry. And he, uh, so there was a recipe in the book for chocolate eclairs so I followed it so far but the topping that he was putting on the chocolate eclairs was was just chocolate just melted chocolate and I decided I'd prefer to use the recipe from um, Mary Berry and she had a she did her chocolate topping included butter and icing sugar as well so it was more of a chocolate fondant icing and I decided that would be nice and would be softer so actually uh, I think if I made them again I would just use chocolate because the or else I would make sure that I made the chocolate fondant icing a little bit thicker because it was actually a bit thin well it became translucent as it dried <laughs> so it didn't look so dark and chocolatey uh, but I, yeah, so I think that I'm not going to say any more about them and you can see how I got on making chocolate eclairs for the very first time.
So I can safely say that they were absolutely delicious and they were gone in no time at all. We had we had a visitor and we just ate all of the chocolate eclairs because they were so nice. <laughs> so I will definitely make them again but only when I've got lots of time to spare because it did actually take me about mm, three hours or something start to finish. Although obviously I was trying to video video myself as well uh, but yeah so it's definitely something for when you've got a bit of you know you've got a good morning to spare or good yeah to uh, to go in the kitchen and and bake but oh it was worth the effort and yes I will make them again so I think that is it for this week uh, I will go off and leave you to get on with the rest of your day or evening and I'll be back next time, hopefully in the camper van with the next bit of the Scotland trip. And until then, just take good care of yourself. Keep nice and busy and I will see you again very soon. OK, then. Bye.